Hello, everybody, and welcome to Avid Reader Bookshop. Um, thank you for going quiet. <laughs> that was so quick. I have power. Um, <laughs> Just before we get started today, um, and welcome to the people that have joined us on Zoom as well. Hello. Um, so just before we, we get started today, I just want to um, let you know a couple of bits of housekeeping. One of them is that um, there is there are two toilets. One of them is out there through the car park in the corner, um, a lit cubicle, which is very, very basic, um, but works fine. The other one is upstairs behind the counter, um, so that's where the toilets are there. And um, if you didn't already see copies of the book and a big stack of backlist titles as well, the book is, oh, I just dropped my pen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, the book is front and centre at the counter. Um, so um, do, do please pick that up. Um, and if you are joining us from Zoom and have not yet purchased the book, I can absolutely 100% guarantee that you will not regret buying this book. <laughs> I um, really didn't know if I was the right um, person to be reading this book when I first picked it up. It is absolutely a book for any reader or anyone who ever has been a child. So um, please, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's face it, a few of you have done that. Um, so if, if you're at home and would like a personalised copy signed to you, um, just give the shop a call on 3846-3422 during the event tonight at any time or after the event and um, we can get you to um, paper it over the phone and then you can have a personalised copy just for you. Um, or if um, you'd like to wait and just get a signed copy, we'll get a stack of signed copies afterwards as well, so you can call us tomorrow if you just want one generically signed by Chloe. Um, and I think that might be, oh, if you have a phone, if you turn that to silent, that would be a, another thing I was supposed to tell you. Um, I think that's it. Apart from the fact that there will be time for questions at the end, and if you're on Zoom, you can um, type your questions into the chat bar, um, which you will find because Ewan's just sent a couple of messages, um, and you can reply to the chat bar. Um, that way, we can um, we can get your question and ask Chloe the question at the end. So without further ado, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on in this area of Yagara and the Turrbal people and pay my deepest respects to elders past, present and emerging. And this is a storytelling book. This is storytelling land. This is land on which we have told stories to each other and, um, and First Nations people have told stories in order to live. Um, this book um, that you're about to read or that you have read is absolutely um, a book about how important that process is, important the process of storytelling is. So I feel very grateful to be able to do that on land that has had that history of storytelling for so very, very long. With me tonight is um, Chloe Hooper, whose most recent books are the best-selling The Arsonist, A Mind on Fire, and um, The Tall Man, Death and Life on Palm Island, which won the Victorian, New South Wales, West Australian and Queensland Premier's Literary Awards. <laughs> that was the trifecta, or even more. Um, so as well as it won that, it won the John Button Prize for Political Writing and a Ned Kelly Award for Crime Writing. You've probably read it already. It, is, it was the book of the year um, and continues to sell really well for us. It's a book that's very important for us. Um, Chloe is also the author of two acclaimed novels, A Child book, Child's Book of True Crime and The Engagement. She lives in Melbourne with her partner and two sons, which might be a spoiler if you're <laughs> hanging on every word of this book wondering does he live or does he die because this is a book about a cancer diagnosis a brush with death a trip to the underworld and back but we know that don watson your partner is well and truly alive right now which is a relief but that isn't a spoiler because this gorgeous book is not that kind of beast it is not a book about the life and death of one man it is a book about each and every one of us and how we deal with grief and how we tell stories to ourselves um, and how those stories are so revealing about our own grief. It's also a thing made of love, 
to pass on to your children, to pass on to all our children who will inherit a world that is frightening and dangerous. I can't begin to tell you all the things this book was for me because once you open it, it's like a Pandora's box. All the terrors and joys and gifts of a life fell out into my lap. So thank you for this gift. Oh. <laughs> you made me cry, so I now need to make you cry. <laughs> Um, I, I actually didn't um, check this with you before, but I, did you did you get the message? I wanted you to do a little bit of a reading from the book. Is, is that a message you got? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I thought, you know, oh. <laughs> I thought I'd post it on. Sorry, everyone. Um, no, I didn't get that message, but of course is I'd be possible? delighted to. Of course. <laughs> Excellent. I thought we'd start by telling a story. So if you could tell us a little bit of your story. Absolutely. That would be great. Um, but I just firstly want to say that it is such an honour to be here with the, the, such an amazing writer, Chrissy, and um, know that you, you support such a wide range of um, people in our literary community and that there are so many writers here tonight is also um, a, a thrill. My people are here and after the last few years in Melbourne and in Australia, everything has been so so sort of desiccated that it's really um, a thrill to be sitting with you all tonight. So thank you. That's the, the finished. Okay. That's the finished copy. I won't. <laughs> I won't. Uh, I won't sort of crack the spine too hard. <laughs> we, we charge extra for the copy. <laughs> 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 Uh, can I um I'll, I'll read to you a little bit from the from the from the start. I won't give that one give anything away. Mm -hmm. Every night when the light switched off, familiar objects in your room mutate. What daylight tames, the dark untames. Bookshelves, reading lamp, a dressing gown draped on the door, all gather a silent force. The stillness feels alive, as if each thing is deciding how to behave. At first, there's a thrill to this sudden chaos. You're not yet listening to the in and out of your own breathing, not yet decoding the noises in and outside the house. The shimmer of the dark makes climbing into bed feel less like surrendering. You've used all your wiles to put off this moment, and yet, it turns out your limbs are heavy and the sheets are cool. You wait while we draw the curtains against the night or any dawn waking. You wait as we straighten you and your brother's bedclothes. Already he can't stop his eyelids from closing. You keep waiting and we reshelve the picture books. On these books' pages, life is reduced to its essential elements. The sun is a yellow ball in the sky, the road a black ribbon leading to green. The woods are reliably timbered and within them a monster is a monster, no need to factor in his childhood. The stories are soothing because the turnings of the plot are so well worn, their surprises practised. Each night people are sad then happy. They get lost and found and return to their houses that have a front door between two windows. It doesn't occur to your father or me to tell you what is really happening here inside this house, why the force between objects is charged differently for us too. We don't want to let dread through the bedroom door and we don't want anything about these nights to change. There's a couch set against the wind, the wall between you and your brother's beds. Your father sits there in the glow of a planet Earth nightlight. If you turn, you can see his profile. Glasses on a still boyish nose, but a forehead lined deeply. Sometimes there's the wind, even in the dark of breaking through the thicket of his thoughts to make him smile. Your father... I'm going to keep going. <laughs> we just want a little paragraph, okay? No, no, no. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Your father, 
Don, as you call him, is older than your friend's father's. You know this. I was born in the olden days, as you put it, but he in the olden, olden days. <laughs> One of the advantages of his age is, is that he knows more stories and you prefer him to put you to bed because then the picture books are only the prelude. When he's finished reading, he makes up something just for you. Both of us are writers, although the original bedtime tales are his domain. Thank, thank oh. you. Oh, there you go. It's a great book. That's it. Thank you. Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Where was the toilet again? Yeah. That's right. Look, this is a book about grief, um, about your grief and um, your sons um, and the grief of having to tell your sons about a cancer diagnosis. Um, and so it's a hard, it's a hard book to think about starting to write. I wanted to ask you about the decision that you made to write it down and when did this become a decision to write a book or was it a decision to write just what you were going through so you could deal with it or was it a decision to write a book right up front? Uh, at, at first it was, um, I guess, the way that people might keep a diary just to deal with um, what they're going through. I would... Um, write snippets on the back of envelopes um, as it was taking place because I mean I think that you know that's the irony of um, when you get a diagnosis like this in, in a family which I'm sure most people have dealt with a moment like this suddenly um, everything becomes far more vivid and um, uh, you know you and and kind of you know clearer and the Colours seem brighter, strangely. And, and that's because of the proximity to Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that sort of poignancy suddenly. Um, so that, you know, you, you kind of, you, you find there's sort of this magic uh, thread through everything. Um, uh, and I think that though, I, I imagine that I would write something that would be kind of short. I mean, the other thing is, uh, you know, cancer is expensive. And so there was also a moment of thinking, <laughs> I better, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna have to keep working here. Um, and, uh, yeah. but there was an immediacy to this and also a sense I, that I um, felt that, um, that other people might be in a similar situation and, and um, you know, the, the, the ways that I always find in comfort in these stories that, that others might as well. So was there an actual moment where you stopped just taking notes and you went, okay, this is going in the computer and it's going in a file, it's going to be a book? Was there, do you remember if there was a clear moment of change from um, an experience that you were writing to writing down the experiences? I, I, think, I, I think I knew right away. I mean, Don, Don and I, you know, we had a kind of a, um, I think of it as a sort of high noon moment where it was who was going to grab it at the end of the first. Oh, oh, oh dueling oh, books. Oh, oh, man, that's excellent. And, and um, you won. You well, won against yeah. the person with cancer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, it's, uh, he was at a disadvantage. <laughs> a bit tired of the news. <laughs> but I think, I mean, he is, he is, very private. I'm not sure which is was sort of most excruciating for him, being writing about himself or someone else writing about him. But um, did he make you share it as you were going? No, 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 God, no. 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 I mean, but he also didn't. He also knew what I was doing, and uh, <laughs> I'm just going to write the book, this novel that I'm writing <laughs> in the other room because there's, you know, there are elements about his childhood put in here. So I was sort of, you know, suddenly he had that. Uh, I guess. It's the feeling that, you know, um, some other people I've written about might feel when I ask a question and, you know, the tape recorder is on. Um, Did he talk to you about that on the way, on the way through? I, I really, he was, you know, he was terrifically supportive, actually. And um, I guess that, um, you know, in the end, I, 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 it's, a, I it's, a, it's, a, it's a document of love. And um, he didn't ask me to change anything. So um, you did have to run it by him at the end, though. That, that, that's right. Yes. <laughs> With the possibility that it's a no to some things. 
Yes, yes. And it isn't. So yes. that's fantastic. Good testament to your writing skills, actually. Well, or, or maybe some other interpersonal things. <laughs> <laughs> not going to take you to your appointment, unless. <laughs> oh, so much to learn <laughs> from these writers. <laughs> are, are, are brutal. We are terrible. Anybody's friends with any other writers in this room? Shocking. This is like a support group, though, because I feel like so most people in this room are writers. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of them, I have to admit. You'll get one if you throw some yeah. writers yeah. among us. <laughs> yeah. Look, there's um, one of the things that, that you get pretty early on in this book that because you are um, you, you go about looking for books yes. that um, talk about cancer diagnosis okay. or talk about death, talk about a death of a parent. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey into um, into getting those original books that you wanted, which were about the death? Uh, well, I um, what I needed to do because he was come and see you, or actually come <laughs> and see a. a Culture sort of, uh, in the back, there's a bookseller for kids. Yes. Yeah, I needed to go into a bookshop, but I, I had a, um, you know, well, I, I had a kind of phobia about buying these books. And, and um, I started, I would look for them online, you know, the kids were in bed, and then I would sort of, you know, gingerly write, you know, cancer or children's book into a search engine. And, and at first, the things that I kind of were, you know, I feel as though my own awkwardness about this topic dredged up some really sort of uh, mawkish and kind of, you know, um, and so all sort of strangely saccharine things. Um, and were any of them useful to you? When well, you I think this books? is, I think that the problem was that I wasn't ready to read them. And so then I decided that I was going to look at, uh, you know, the history of children's literature. And I, I thought there must be something from, you know, from the days of, of plague and war. I mean, this was the innocent age of 2018. Yeah, right. Eternity ago. Yes. Um, uh, that, would, that would be helpful. And, but then I started to read you know, often quite academic work on children's literature. And so I would be, you know, reading through this sort of quite dense um, academic work, which is written in this sort of, I love the way that the prose is so um, measured and sort of unemotional. Um, and I would start each thing thinking that in the footnote, maybe there'll be a sort of some gem about mortality that I'll be able to then look up and, and find. And I'd read, get to the end of them and just be sort of furious that I was sort of reading these things as if, they were going to be, um, you know, a sort of bullet, bullet points and a, a guidebook um, and <laughs> an easy gu academic yeah. guide. Yeah, to yeah. I was, I was really, uh, I was looking for love in all the wrong places. Yeah. <laughs> and how, how old were your children at the time? My children were, our children were uh, three and six at the time. And very uh, different ages for reading, really. Yes. Um, and had and they had different. I mean, the, the ways that um, they could understand this were were uh, really different. But actually, it was through you know once I I had a kind of turning point when I started to actually look beyond the books at the the lives of those who had written the books. Mm. Oh, and look, we'll come to that. Yeah, but okay. All right. <laughs> 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 Very important yeah. turning point for okay. me. But I, I want to talk a little bit about early on in the book, we find out um, that we deal with death in a very culturally specific way. In, in our culture, it's different to how other cultures deal with death. Can you talk a little bit about what you discovered about, you know, I suppose Western kind of culture and our kind of dealings with death as opposed to other cultures. Well, I, you know, we, I grew up, I mean, Don and I obviously, we have 25 years between us and we grew up in really different uh, um, worlds. But he talks about when he was younger, um, you know, cancer was just like a word that was, you know, it was a sort of cough, you'd cough it into your, your fist and uh, it was like, oh, you know, and that's the way that it was dealt with. Um, and I, you know, also grew up, I had this memory of um, my mother had a really close family friend over for dinner and she must have had stage four cancer and 
she was wearing a, 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 a beautiful silk evening dress and a, and a, and a wig and um, none of the other guests at the dinner party, I mean, were told that she was sort of seriously ill. And then the next day, she, my mum was really pissed off at another guest who kept leaning across the table saying, you don't look very well, oh, you know, oh. and, but that no one, yeah. it's sort of amazing. No one talked about it at that all. That it was just sort of, um, yeah. so we, so basically I grew up in this really, both of us grew up in this kind of slightly waspy repressed homes is I, I guess what we're word I'm sorry, I take all that back to you. <laughs> but it was it was the way it was. We didn't talk about um those things. There were certain conversations that were not dinner party conversations. Whereas today, um now with your friends, you seem to we seem to talk about everything. Well, I think there's yes, that's right. And but I think that there was no <laughs> it's particularly you. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I think that there actually there has been a, a you know, I realized also um in my reading that there's there sort of is this protectionist trend in children's literature, which I guess is is you know, children's literature is an amazing mirror of of our society. And um really for the we've lived through this you know medical miracle in the last hundred years and so uh death is something that now takes place we we expect that we're going to let all lead very long healthy lives and death takes place in in nursing homes and hospitals and um it it doesn't we we don't sort of you know we don't want it to be in the, the bright um stories that we we give to children we, we but actually in, in the old days it was there was a sort of reversal that you know kids were told that they came from a stork you know from the stork um and yet they were sort of you know they you know the victorians loved anything about everybody carking it <laughs> um whereas now we kind of like give lots of kids these books on you know really sort of intimate details about sort of sex and uh, gender and all kinds of things, but we don't want to necessarily talk about, you know, about this death. existential, yeah. have this existential conversation. And we also don't have bodies in the house um, anymore. Like there, mm -hmm. there was a time when people had the body in the house and you'd be able to come and Yes, and, and, and there were, you know, and, and, in, and lots of different cultures have, you know, really involved uh, funeral rituals, which, yeah. have, which, you know, young people are involved in as well, which... Yeah. Um, you talk a bit about that in the book, and I found that really fascinating. Um, that you know, to think that there are, you know, there are other cultures where we are still very much in touch with death, and kids yeah. know how to deal with it because they know how to grieve, they know about sorry business, even That's in right. the indigenous culture. Um, you know, sorry business is a big thing, and people of all ages know about sorry business and how to deal with it. Um, interesting, it's interesting that we have kept it as a medicalized thing that's separate. Yes, ourselves. yes, it, it is, and I, but I do wonder whether or not now we're entering a different um, period, socially and culturally. Um, well, I wonder if I wonder if COVID that's, um, I guess what I, has changed yeah. that for people where we've seen a lot more people die this year of COVID, a lot closer as well. Um, I wanted to talk about um, those fundamental stories, so. In a way, there are kind of origin stories and fundamental stories that kind of make us who we are. And what were some of those books that you kind of eventually, after you'd gone to the books about <laughs> cancer, the books about grandpa dying, yes. whatever, yeah. um, and then you um, you went to some fundamental literature, some real real classics. Can you talk a little about that journey towards those books and what books did you kind of look into? What myths and legends did you go to? Well, I I realised actually that, I mean, I, uh, you know, I did realise that the problem was me uh, and the, uh, there are some fantastic books that talk about, um, about the cycle of life for, for kids, but also I realised, you know, and I, I know that on your on your scheme on the on the paper, I was not meant to talk about. Oh no, do it now. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. 
just you know, I'll get some more. <laughs> um, I, I had this moment of feeling like, well, you know, I I, I was so desperately trying to keep us in this Eric Carle um, color scheme, and then when I actually sort of started to look at the details of Carle's life and um, realized that actually that book is about the deprivations felt by a child in a war torn war torn Germany and, and as he as he describes it as an antidote to the muted camouflage colour scheme that he grew up in and, and he didn't have enough food and uh, then his father was taken off as a as a prisoner of war. Uh, and he was sent to dig trenches as a as a 15 year old by getting the picture across. I mean actually um, that that often these um, stories, which we think of as joyful, actually one of the sort of really important ingredients is, is grief. Mm -hmm. And um, just as we were, you know, confronting uh, losing Dawn, uh, there that the actual kind of the, the way that the colours could, you know, the colours in our garden seem brighter, you, you do find um that that sort of uh thread of grief can um that it was already there actually in all of these books around us what were the other um authors you 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 went into quite a few i did i'm sorry about that because i, I couldn't right. stop myself i once loved I, it it was I... actually one of the joys of this book was discovering the lives yeah. of these authors i know i mean it really was sort of once i went, went once i found that uh it was the there the, the brothers grim um well the, the, there was a, there's a long list of, of, of authors who, of children's authors who suffered a, a childhood bereavement and the Brothers Grimm, uh, Hans Christian Andersen, um, Francis Hodgson Burnett, Ellen Mook, Mami Cry, Ellen Montgomery, uh, Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, Dahl, um, it's it, Antoine Saint Zubery. Um, you know, Philip Pullman, it's um, really, you realise actually how an element of, of good storytelling actually is, is, um, is the dark. Yeah, absolutely. So the connection to that grief and that darkness um, was in some of those cases the reason that they wrote so beautifully about life. I think so. I think that there's an element too in some of those books where they're actually kind of Going back into a lost Eden, and 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 uh, Tolkien plants in Narnia a, a tree that uh, bears you know silver fruit that can heal a mortally ill parent, and so actually there's a way of um, you know storytelling is our way of controlling the dark. Yeah, absolutely. There's um, in terms of um, your reading too. There's there's certain symbols that can up a lot um, you talk about things like water things like the ocean and the forest can you talk about those kind of um, those symbols that seem to repeat in terms of um, what children are learning from books about the forest and books about the ocean? yes yes uh, I guess so many fairy stories involve uh, walking through the woods and um, so uh, what do the woods represent, do you think, in these books? <laughs> well, the woods uh, represent um, the moment when you uh, and and uh, I'm, I feel like it's sort of you know embarrassing amongst this 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 crowd to uh, pretend that I've come up with these concepts. But I mean, if you go to <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if Bertelsmann writes about it, but also Francis Buford, and I'm not sure if anyone here has read, I mean, I'm sure actually you have one right talking about it. Of course you've probably read it. Um, Francis uh, Buford's um, beautiful memoir, The, the, the Child That uh, Books Built. And, okay, you would love that book. But, uh, it, and, uh, you know, it's the, I guess the idea of the, the forest is um, that the, uh, the protagonist enters the forest at the moment that um, the kind of framework of their life has collapsed and um, you know suddenly I've got to stop saying you know because somebody 
came up to me after an event recently and said, could you stop saying you know? Um, I hate it when they pick out that stuff for you because that's it. It's all you can hear forever and ever. Don't do no, that. No, I'm, I appreciated that feedback, Chrissy. Oh. No, 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 I wasn't attending at all. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. <laughs> uh, the, the, one finds oneself in, <laughs> in the forest, you know, with a tangle of, of branches and uh, suddenly unable to see the way. So the moment that a path emerges is obviously a very uh, important moment in, in a story, um, in a fairy story. And uh, I wanted to capture that sense of being lost, lost in the woods. I mean, I, and I guess, um, you know, midway through, midway through my life, to paraphrase, you know, I found myself in a dark wood. Um, but I guess that Anna Walker, who's illustrated this book so beautifully, I also said to her, I, I, um, I love the way, I rang her and said, I love the way you do weather. And I, um, I, there is, there are also so many, I guess, I looked into the Odyssey and ideas of being at sea. And I, I said, I want you to um, capture the feeling of being at sea because there's that sort of queasiness and seasickness when you're when you don't know um, what's going to happen in 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 a, in, a, in a story like this. Were you ever tempted? I mean, there's there's stories within this story as well. It's um there's actual it, you kind of flip into um, storytelling mode for children at some points in this book, which I love the fact that suddenly. You're talking to adults and suddenly you're plunged into an actual story for kids. Well, I mean, that's a, it's ridiculous to think that children's stories are only for children because at the best of them, you know, capture something that is um, essential and the, the, it's, it's, you know, the, they're poetry actually because the language is so pared back and, um, you know, not there's not a sort of a wrong word there. Um, it's actually like you've done it so beautifully and handled it so beautifully because there are some points which I was reading and I just thought I couldn't bear it if I if I hear this next bit and it's going to be terrible and then you um, flipped into a storytelling mode for children and it gave it, it was almost like a metaphor for what you were doing in real life and what you were feeling in real life so although it was poignant it may it meant that I didn't I wasn't plunged into the horror of the mm. situation it's, uh, I mean, I keep, I don't mean to keep quoting C.S. Lewis because actually there are so many things about his books that I really hate, uh, but he, um, it's about religion. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, I mean, I guess so many of these books really, you also realise, and, you know, I write a little bit about that, if them are, how colonial they are. Um, but he, he talks about children's stories being, you know, the, the finest medium for something that you have to say, I mean, I guess it worked for him, but there, there is actually something about how distilled these uh, stories are and, and like myth, they're stripped back and um, they kind of enter your bones in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I, I think if you remember, you know, the, we all have a book in childhood that, that sort of has hit the bloodstream in a way that I think doesn't happen quite quite the same way as when you're an adult. Yeah, Straw Peter. I remember that. So I don't know if anyone knows that book, but um, mm -hmm. there was, you know, it, there was Mr. Scissor's Hands who oh. the boy was um, ch chewing his nails and so the Scissor's Hands cut off his fingers and there's a picture of him bleeding to death. And the girl, <laughs> so the, the girl didn't look at where she was going and she like tripped into the water and drowned. And every second page has a dead kid on it. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say something like, Yes, where the wild things are. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I was much more impacted by um, Stuart Peter. I have to admit the Germanic um, storytelling tradition is slightly different to ours, I think. Anyway. Um, enough of that. But Sen Sendak, you know, actually is also an author who, you know, grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust. So, true, yeah, um, true. You know, amazing how. And he talks about that. The, the wild things being, you know, his his elderly relatives with kind of bulbous noses and and uh, yeah yeah the raucous and raucous you know, tribe. Big, big teeth. You you mentioned before about um, the idea that a lot of our books teach us about racism as well. And in in the book you say 
can a book with racist stereotypes make you racist is a question that you're asking that book because some of those books do have those stereotypes and I wonder if you um if you do think that um our culture can be shaped um from the inside out by the stories that we tell can we actually make ourselves a more racist culture by writing racist children's books well we know that our ours you know our culture is shaped by stories and I mean we've just had a kind of amazing battle of storytelling haven't we within this federal election and um and I think that the stories that we tell, you know, children, which kind of, where, I mean, um, the Inania, the baddies are um, dark skinned, bearded men with turbans on. And in Lord of the Rings, you know, they're um, kind of wild, dark skinned um, characters. So, um, in it, and it does, you know, it absolutely has an impact. Um, and, I, you know, I also think there's a sort of this nuts thing of reading so many of my kids' books I realised were, um, there were, there were anthropomorphic animals. And, you know, I'm, you know, every night I would have a book in my hands about a rabbit, um, you know, be it Peter Rabbit or Miffy or, the you know the, the the bunny in the in the great green room uh, in Goodnight Moon and and then I sort of suddenly think rabbits in this continent have <laughs> yeah you know, not the best heroes the topsoil you know mm. for and you know I mean it was just you know it is actually kind of or I think also I have an issue with the way that we we um, you know uh, we kind of use these animals as empty vessels to mm. um, talk about you know human um, uh, hopes and fears and then we kind of disregard the animal la later when the, it, it's sort of a well well meant sham mm. to um, use these creatures and actually rather than building any connection with nature it, it kind of uh, severs it yeah we're bringing them into the human world rather than they're yeah. eating out of teeth you know, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And in the burrow there's a just, you know everyone's in a four poster yeah, with a quilt on it, which is the way to be. Come on, rabbits, get it together. That's exactly right. If there's one thing I hope this book would do. <laughs> How many people have picked that up? <laughs> Look, I am interested in this idea, and you talk a little bit about the hero's journey. Anthony has mm -hmm. talked to me endlessly about the hero's journey. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I haven't heard enough about it. product <laughs> <laughs> It's a critique. It's a critique. But, but, but I'm interested because um, you mentioned it as well. You talk about the fact that the hero's journey is for some people can be heroes and some people are not. So there's the hero, um, the role of hero in a way, and I'm pretty sure that's what I read into your book or maybe I was just hearing Anthony's voice in my head, mm. but that the role of hero and the person who's putting themselves in the role of hero, that there's there's only some people who can be that hero who goes to the underworld and comes back unscathed. So the hero can't be the one who goes to the underworld and dies there, I suppose. Are there, are there these books telling us something about what it is to be heroic as well that maybe we need to question? Well, I think of it maybe slightly differently that um, these stories are told to children so that perhaps that they... Um, learn to see themselves as as agents in their own story rather than I mean in fairy tales the protagonist kind of wanders along and things happen to them uh, you know and and I, I you know there's they don't really break a sweat if um, you know um, suddenly they are saved by a you know good fairy or if a, if a wolf comes along I mean it's just sort of you know um, whatever they just are these kind of flat characters that, that keep on moving through whereas I suppose that um, you know we tell our kids and ourselves more complicated stories to actually um, you know as simulations on making decisions and um, and to try to sort of I guess uh, teach people that they can find something in themselves that's heroic um, but, you know, 
the story always has to be passed on. I mean, the story always has to be passed on to keep going. Um, so there has to be a survivor at the end of the story to be able to pass that story on. Yeah, as well. Yeah, it's interesting. It did make me think a lot about who who are the heroes in our stories and um, what who's left out of that equation <laughs> as well. What about the kid who might be in the cancer ward who maybe is not going to come back from the underworld? Well, I mean, I guess that any you know all stories are about where you where you decide to. Um, to end them, aren't they? You know, and and so certainly you can frame that in that 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 child is the hero. Mm. Um, yeah, I I think it's all about you know framing it, the, the frame, and then you know. Well, luckily your story has the frame that it has. I'm I'm so glad that you got to be able to ask Don about whether he was okay to um, let this book into the world. The other option Thank would have you. been you could have been on the partial on him in the other version. That's right. But, <laughs> but this nice, kind version um, has... Well, we've all got to watch our backs. <laughs> because we have to do what we do. But, um, but it, is, it is lovely to be able to kind of read this book. And yet I read this book with this kind of sense of, even though I know how this journey ends for you, I read this book with this kind of page-turning sense of wanting wanting to know how it ended and wanting to know um, his, his journey, which was amazing to be able to hold those two truths in my head at the one time, um, which is it, a testament to your skill as a writer. Well, I think this is actually a testament to story. That, yeah. you, are, you know, when you are reading a story, you're, you're in the story. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, true. if you're if you're reading about being at sea, you're actually at sea. I mean, that you know, I think they've done brain scans to someone surely somewhere has done a brain scan <laughs> <laughs> Must have, surely. To, to prove that we do actually have a sort of physiological reaction to the stories yeah. that we read. So yeah. there is there is. I'll tell you about the science experiment afterwards. <laughs> 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 you should wind everybody up tonight. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, that's true. Um, but that's something that you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, really story, stories are incredibly powerful. But um, I just also wanted to ask about um, the images. Images along with those children's stories are also incredibly powerful and sometimes work alongside them to tell a different story to what you actually see in the story. And I wanted to ask a little bit, a bit about working on the images in this book and did you have any input into it? Because it's beautiful. It's like subtle. Um, subtle um, darkness and light and shade and, and it goes very spare in some places where you have mm. hardly any words yeah. on the page. Yeah. Did you have any put into all of that? Mm. Um, yes, I, I did and I really loved that because I, I, I think there's always, um, you know, I think you're, I think often um, it's it's how can you make the book interesting to yourself as well? Or how can you do something aesthetically that feels like you're being, you're kind of uh, um, pushing what a book can do? I mean, uh, to keep things um, interesting and, and, uh, and alive. And um, I was, there was a certain moment in the book where I felt that it needed to be in a different register. And suddenly I thought, well, you know, that's what, illustrations do in children's books they take us to a different place so um I started to imagine how they could be and I um I actually worked with a friend on on it um for a while and he is a brilliant illustrator uh, cartoonist actually Bernard Callio and then Anna um obviously is a very very beloved as a children's book illustrator and I um, was so fortunate that she was was prepared to come on board and um, she found often that what was most effective were the most abstract illustrations. Um, and then it was laid out by Alison Colpoy, who is also, um, a, you know, absolute star illustrator in her own right and book designer. So some of the kind of really creative ways that they've laid out the, the text are, are, you know, Alison's um, beautiful work. So they were, that was just a really dreamy actually working with, with those two women who are just so, so brilliant really. Yeah. Can I ask you about your sons? 
Oh, yes. And um, what do they know about this book and how, like, I, you know, the, they're still yes. quite young. They're, how they're now, uh, oh, yeah, both those guys. Um, <laughs> they are, they're 10 and 7 now. Right. So what, what do you tell them? Do you read the bits of it or would have, were they a part of knowing what was in the book? How do you approach them? Uh, they... They know they know kind of the the outline of the story, um, and um, one of them for years has been asking me to write a story for him, um, and I've said to him, "This is this is the story for you," and um, he saw the pages on the floor and was <laughs> um, looked through them and, and was just said, I can't see my name anywhere. <laughs> and of course, it's written in the second person. I said, don't worry, you are there. Um, Chrissy, you know, um, later on, uh, I might need to sort of use some of the royalties to contribute to their, you know, <laughs> therapy, their shrink bills. Yeah, but, true. Uh, Every writer probably <laughs> needs to be such So that's fair enough. Look, um, yeah, so later, later there will be um, a reckoning. Um, well, I, I, I hope that they'll actually later on, they'll, they'll take it off the shelf and there'll be a moment where they understand this moment in, in their lives. Um, it's a beautiful but, gift um, for them. And the end of the book thank is you, definitely thanks, a beautiful gift for them. They're going to cry one day when they read this book, I think, mm -hmm. um, which is it's just so, so mm -hmm. lovely, so delightful. Um, we are going to go to questions from the audience. Oh, very, very soon. Um, but um, before we do, I... Um, would like to ask just briefly about what happens after you've written a book like this? Because this feels like a big project and one that's incredibly personal. Um, and what do you what do you write after you've finished a book that is about life and death? Is is anything going to top this moment for you? Uh, well, I, I wrote a long profile on Jackie Lambie. <laughs> 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 it, was very, it, was very it was very good. A very good Thank profile. Thanks, thanks, folks. Is that, is that it from now on? Just profile. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, you know, I, that that is. Um, you're always one is always casting around for what what will the next thing be, and I, but, you know, I'm I'm really interested in this moment in in Australia and um, whether or not we can actually see real change um how do we make change happen i'm, I'm you know I, so that's something that i'm interested in and maybe interested in writing about but i um non-fiction or fiction oh uh, i i'm i feel at the moment in my life a fiction is um is hard to write because i have limited time and there's a kind of daydreaming that uh i think fiction requires that it's hard to do at the moment with um with raising kids yeah. so something about non-fiction you just sort of get sent off somewhere and it's like i'm holding up five <laughs> five fingers you know that's that's yeah, yeah. um just describe that and i, and I, just quite, see like, the world. Yeah. I quite like the the way that 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 um i quite like doing that just describing five fingers fantastic <laughs> 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 so we have time for some questions from the audience um, does anyone have any questions for each other? Anything at all? Yes, Kasha. Uh, Chloe, I'm wondering whether writing that book felt like a cathartic thing to do. Like, I know that it came from you wanting to find tools to talk to the children. So I'm wondering if you mentioned that it's not like, oh, actually, I was a problem. I was yeah. Yes. Did it help you? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And then I guess to is it different once it's out there and they're talking about it? Yeah, the that, question is, great right question, was this catharsis for the people on Zoom? Was this book cathartic for you? Um, and is it different now that it's out there? Does that experience change? I think that um, all of the all of the children's authors who I mentioned, I mean, I, I think that they're probably a, um, a, co a common um, palliative for them was actually writing. And um, I think that for, for, for those of us who write, there is a sense sometimes that if you can control the story on the page, you can control it slightly better in 
in your own head. Um, and so uh, I think of each book as you're sort of crafting your own escape room. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I, you get to well, close the door and go <laughs> off and as you're making each sentence sort of as good as it can be, you know, that's very consuming and you, you're, um, you can escape some of the other, um, you know, issues in your life. Um, but, yes, when you publish it, it the, the escape room gets crowded and you need to make a new one. <laughs> In, like in the process of writing or in the process of, of having to write this book, did you find that your children um, had experienced a loss which wasn't the death of your partner, but like a loss of innocence or a loss of you know, seeing the world in a certain way because they thought that it was a rash for however long you have another time? Well, I, I um, my, during this book, um, or the time that is described in this book, um, my older son's best friend's father actually was was diagnosed with cancer a few weeks before dawn, and and uh, they were diagnosed in March of two thousand and eighteen, and and um, um, Tobias's son, uh, Tobias's friend's father died in that, in that November. So actually, they they we sort of lived through to some sort of tiny extent. The other plot, and um, I think that um, what I realized was actually it's much better to acknowledge the dark with children. And children are kind of natural philosophers. They they like talking about uh, the mysteries of, of you know the greatest mystery of life. And um, I think that it's cathartic for them to be able to talk openly um, with, with the adults in their life about it. I, I remember going to a um, meeting somebody at a dinner and she had just been with her daughter that day and, and she said to me that this child who was four maybe had um, been in the back seat of the car and had looked out the window and said, all these people are going to die. <laughs> and that and the, she, the mother and the grandmother who were in the car turned around and said, that's terrible. Don't say that. And you know, I, you know, the child is right. And actually, if you can then say, uh, yes. So how are we best going to live? You know, mm -hmm. and if you can actually then use that conversation to talk about how do we have the best life? I think for for adults too, that's a really kind of necessary conversation. And um, it's a great lesson. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's that's what I take from this whole kind of period. How do we how do we best live? What I really wanted to ask you, but no one else talked about it, but I will. Okay. Um, is about um, the fact that we've just lived through and we're still living through a pandemic. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, we're we're being told publishers don't want books about the pandemic. We're being told not to write about the pandemic. And I wonder. Um, and we're, we've been told readers don't want to read about the pandemic. Mm. And I wonder how, how on earth can we deal with something as grief-stricken and, um, you know, something as big as that without being able to write about it and put those words out there? Uh, yes, it's, it seems remarkable, doesn't it? I mean, we have, like, a, a kind of amazing um, ability to um, switch off from... Um, you know, I mean, it's like climate change, isn't it? <coughs> People don't want to deal with these big existential, um, you know, ideas. And it's, um, should we be writing about this stuff? Is this something you think, as, as a writer, do you think we should be? Well, I think that we should, but it's also finding ways in which uh, people are prepared to read it. Um, so I think that's always the, 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 the complication. And uh, it's and it's therefore you know up to up to writers to find ways of storytelling, which um, you know stories can be used to um, get to the truth and to obscure it. So um, you know as readers and as writers we have um, to sort of work out where we are going to all um, you know find ourselves on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. 
Very interesting. Any last questions from the audience? A last question. Yes. Have you changed the relationship with Deb? Um, I, yes, I, I, I hope so. How have well, you changed? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that we all, like to some extent, regard um, this as being a, a terrible thing that happens to others. And um, now I. Um, now I can look at um, the stories which previously I thought didn't address um, didn't address death and, and see that it is sewn in there. Um, so I think that it was actually about learning um, that I wasn't conscious of my own phobias and um, and uh, now I now I see that. Now I see that they're there. I'm not sure if that's a, a good answer, but I, I mean, it's 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 the hardest thing to really talk about. Uh, I think. I mean, as you said, our, our culture is notoriously crap. Yes. The, the yes. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you've kind of found that's a way of talking about it yourself, not just to others, but also to my to my to yourself. myself. Yeah. Um, Oh, well, I'd like to think so, but I mean, it's it's. Uh, I'm sure if you once you start to think you're good at it, I wonder if that's the moment <laughs> <laughs> that you have to sort of question, go back to first principles again. Um, I'm better at talking with my children about this and, and um, you know, we, we have some really fruitful conversations about it and, and um, um, you know, you have to, you'll have to go easy on me. I mean, it's sort of ba baby steps, but I'm sort of mo I'm moving, you know, I'm moving in the right direction. There was a couple of other questions. So, Christine. Um, I really relate to the idea of writers finding a form of control over things when they're confronted with something big. It's like, you know, I'll research it and write about yes, it. Yes, absolutely. And it made me, and forgive me, I haven't read the book yet, but um, if there hadn't been a, ha a happy ending, if John hadn't recovered, do yes. have you thought for how would you have been able to finish the book? Would you? Yes, I, I, I would have. I'm just trying to remember when I was contracted to write it. But, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I, I thought you know that. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think that you know we're you know we're both we're both writers, and um, <coughs> I don't think he would have been sort of you know offended if I'd published this with a different ending had it had that happened um you might have had to remove the bird stuff a little bit later in the plot um, there's this beautiful beautiful stuff in it with uh, don and his relationship to his garden your garden yes but also his garden um but also the the birds in the tree and his delight and love of these birds that have babies and um, yes and that would be you know that's such a light no, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I am, uh, um, I guess I'm being facetious because by the time I really seriously was writing this, you know, I knew that we had had um, our own kind of fairy tale at the end of it. And that did make writing it, obviously, a completely different endeavour. I was wondering, you know, I thought, was there a point where you were writing going, come on, go make a decision, how's it going to go? No, 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 I, 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 no, no, I knew he was in remission and, 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 and thank you for the stories. The book's due, come on. <laughs> What's happening? There was a question at the back too that I, I can't remember who it was. Was it you? Yes. Yeah, um, I was just curious, um, I can talk to a bit about um, books that, oh, well, I, they're about death, but very much not clearly about death. Yes. Were any of the like the kind of I work on wild things, like any of them more clearly like we will always share with people like the death of the Chula yes, or yes. Um, lifetimes and something around yes, between. Yes. Were any of those um ones you want were willing to reach out to all that yeah. useful? Yes. Well I, I've actually um I published in um the Guardian a few weeks ago, my sons and I did a, 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 a review together of, of 10 or 12 books that are for children around, around this, this topic. And, um, and I did find them useful, but I sort of, I, I found them useful in terms of, um, 
you know, strangely, a, a, a picture might be, or it might have been useful, or a, or a phrase, or I mean, I actually, it was a symphony of those stories rather than one in particular, I think, which actually um, were really kind of, you know, they were the breadcrumbs that that I followed. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm sorry to sort of just kind of reach for these metaphors, but it is sort of, you know, I was thinking today, you're, it's, you're, you're trying to spin your straw into sort of something golden to um, give give the kids and and all of those you know all of those things are you know in some ways in some ways helped but I don't think there's sort of just you know it's not there isn't just sort of one book because it's a it's having a kind of wider conversation and and they are all refractions I suppose that that can be that can be helpful and I you know are, are good to sort of drop into a literary diet along with the you know it is a fantastic article um if anyone wants to google chloe hooper and the guardian and or if anyone is in a situation where they might need these books, yeah, these, are, these, are, these are great books it's really good and it has it has them listed out and i just i love all of them like them they're really good choices although i think kids had different choices to you yes that's right the kids didn't like death duck and the tulip they gave that six it. and a half because my they suddenly started to give every book <laughs> Like a score, as if this was a diving competition. <laughs> like these numbers were sort of. Mm, I'd give this a seven point three. <laughs> so that was a six point five, whereas I give a nine. But it's interesting. I, I give magic string. You know, that's for me. It's like, oh, okay, do we have to read this? And they're like ten out of ten. So the things that I like and they'd like are, are really different. But yeah. Last question. Yeah, sorry. That's all right. I've worked with children in grief for a decade. Mm. And really, it's usually, particularly at three to six, the fear is the adults. You know, they, they don't yeah. even hold the fear because the death is like going to mm. Paris. Mm. Yes, yeah, it doesn't like, mean yeah. anything. Yeah. In the course of it, did you come to realize how frightened, how fearful we are of protecting children and realizing? Because I think it's one of the things that's gone wrong with society. We shelter them from everything and then they can't cope with anything. Mm-hmm. Whereas in actual fact, when you work at the children's hospital, that's what you see all day, every day, is children fighting to live yes. and fighting to overcome. So mm-hmm. during the course of it, did you did you feel that shift? Yes, I, I do. And I but I, I also sort of questioned, you know, how much was I protecting them or how much was I really just protecting myself? Yeah. And um, I think, you know, being able to look at this in a more, uh, I don't know, balanced way and actually to sort of, you know, accept that the very hungry caterpillar is actually, you know, a sort of celebration of life that's that's born out of, uh, you know, partly out of grief um, and seeing that the sort of dark and light is, is in, so many important stories was really um, for me helped to to face um, and and open up to this conversation with the kids in a way that um, was was constructive and and because you know as you must know how do you talk to children about this without actually kind of making it this crushing conversation how can you actually make it a um, and for all of us uh, an enlivening and conversation like there's two things to say about that when people are like there's no way our children can cope I, I used to always say have you ever let them watch Nemo yeah and they're like yeah why and I'm like okay in the opening scene yeah. the mother yeah. and the all 64 siblings <laughs> are eaten alive yeah. and then he's born with a disability and then he's you know like it just goes on and on every Disney but it's, it's often because there's no death we don't make the connection no that's right and and, and so many I mean orphan stories have been told through yeah. for, for millennia and you know our uh kids kids love the stories but no, obviously if there are no parents they can have fun uh in the story but yes that, that the death has happened off stage look this is an absolutely beautiful book this is a book um for any parent but it's also a book for anybody who wants to look at their own grief um and i feel like we all are dealing with grief at the moment so i feel like we all need this book um grief about climate change grief about the pandemic Grief about the people that, that we've lost in our lives, grief about a possible future. Um, this 
is really a book that I want to put in everybody's hands. I want to put it in all your hands. Um, and I hope that you will purchase a copy. I don't always say this at events because I don't think books are for everyone, but this book is one that I think is for everybody. Oh, can we just like stay here in a coffee? <laughs> <laughs> just read the rest of the book. We all read each other's books and just you know, have chats like this every night. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Toilet out the back. <laughs> it's easy. There's wine. With wine. <laughs> Everyone, this is a great book, and please thank. <laughs>